Thank you so much for worshipping with us online today. I'm so glad that you are with us. Last week, we learned the need and the importance to have others to pray for us, that we should not be ashamed or afraid to have others invite them to pray for us. We learn in this series that we must be interdependent in our relationship instead of being independent. I believe that an interdependent relationship is far more healthy and happy and even a fruitful and a fulfilled life as well. Today, our message is entitled, Carry Me. Now, parents, that familiar eye contact and look from your little child asking you, Daddy, Mommy, up. What does it mean? Sounds familiar, isn't it? This is the carry me request. Babies are carried in their mother's womb for nine months. And once they are out in the world, they enter the fourth trimester. Now, during this time, babies still need to be carried, to be held. And they will often cry as soon as you put them down. It takes them time to get used to their new environment, the new surroundings. They want that same close, warm, safe feeling that they had when they were in the mother's womb. So being held or carried is as close as they can get to the comfort that they are familiar with. Therefore, wanting to be carried is a normal and typical child behavior. Now, so as parents, we carry our children when we want to give them that sense of security and safety. But also, we carry them out of necessity, especially when they could not walk yet. <laughs> now, but then, as they, con as they continue to grow and they're able to walk on their own, we still do carry them at times, especially when they're too sick or too weak to walk. And then at times, well, they were sleeping in the car or sometimes pretending to sleep in the car because they just love to be carried, <laughs> isn't it? Now, unfortunately, as adults, very quickly, we thought that we're too old to be carried or maybe even too heavy to be carried by anyone. <laughs> and and we, 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 we believe that we are to carry our own problems. We are to be independent on our own. And it is a shame <laughs> to still wanting to be carried. But that is not quite true. You see, in life, if I would ask you, have you ever been in a helpless or hopeless situation? Have you ever been in a desperate situation when you were so weak and so low that you needed others to carry you, to carry you through? When your legs fail you, when you need a little help to get back on your feet? Well, just as it is normal and typical for a child to be carried, today I would like to suggest it is also perfectly normal and natural for a grown-up adult like you and I to be carried, maybe not physically, but definitely emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and even mentally. There is no shame to be carried or to be asked to, to, ask to be carried by others in life. Today, I want us to know, if you want to make it in life, you need others. There will be time that you and I would need others to not only pray for us, but to carry us. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. There is a great example, a fantastic story that we are all familiar with. In this passage, in Mark chapter 2 verse 1, let me read. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, 
Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So here there was a man who was paralyzed in this story. And Jesus happened to be in his town. And he heard about Jesus' ability to heal. And obviously he also knew that Jesus, the last time Jesus was in Capernaum, Jesus only stayed for one day. So not knowing how long Jesus would be staying this time, he desperately, urgently and quickly wanted to meet Jesus. But then he could not. There was only one problem. He cannot because he was paralyzed. He was in a helpless and a hopeless situation. As much as he wanted to come to Jesus, he needed his friends to help him. As much as he wanted to be independent, he must admit, he needed to be interdependent in his relationship with his friends. So this story tells us that the four friends carried him to Jesus. So what is Mark wanting us to glean from this very simple, very popular story? Well, the first thing is that in order to make it in life, to be successful in life, we need others to carry us. I want to share with us two points, two observations from this story. And the first thing is that I'd like to ask you, what was the man's name in this story? Did you notice his name? Obviously, the name was not there. He seemed to be a nameless man. And it seems like his name doesn't matter. He was just a nobody. <laughs> in fact, he will always be remembered as the paralytic man. And that was his name. In fact, the only thing we know about him is his brokenness, his weakness. He is defined and described by his weakness and brokenness by others and even till today, by all of us. He is only known by his inability, not his ability. I know that this sounds harsh, so unfair, and it's just not right. But the reality is that, my friends, all of us here, so many times, we are known by others, by our inability, our weaknesses, our brokenness. Oh, he is an angry man. Oh, he is a problematic person. Oh, he is hopeless. Oh, he is an adulterer. Oh, he is a liar. He is a cheater. Oh, that person, he is a nobody. That one is a COVID patient survivor. Mm. And to make matter worse, we somehow tend to believe all of these brandings, all of these labelings that is being put on us, and we begin to agree with those things. Yes, I am a loser. I am a failure. I'm an ugly person. I'm unlovable. This one, I am a sinner. And so oftentimes we say it so nicely and humbly, I am a sinner saved by grace. How about this phrase? I am sick. I am weak. But the thing is, is, my brothers and sisters, Jesus sees us so differently, so differently. We are created in the image of God. We are God's children. We share in His identity, not our own identity. The moment you are in Christ, you share His identity. I am no longer defined by my weaknesses. But now, I'm defined by Christ's identity, His strength. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, the scripture tells us, For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, listen to this carefully. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Paul here is not denying or lying about his past. He said, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am a sinner, I am unrighteous, then I am righteous. <laughs> when I'm unlovable, I am, love, I am beautiful. I am loved because of what Jesus has done. First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Yes, I am sick, but in Christ, I am healed. This is what God says. This is what his word tells me about myself. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Again, Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. <laughs> Why is that when I am weak, then I am strong? Humanly, I am weak, but because Christ lives in me, He is strong, and therefore, I am strong, isn't it? Now, let me read on. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You see, Jesus is not only our identity but our destiny because He invites us to intimacy. So I belong to Him and therefore I become, I become more and more like Him. Our weaknesses and our brokenness may be part of our story it may be part of the way that we came to Jesus, but our weaknesses and our brokenness will not, should not remain to be our identity. I used to be a sinner, but because Christ now lives in me, I am righteous. I used to be sick, but because Christ now lives in me, I am well, I am healed. So remember, our brokenness may be part of the journey, but it's never our destiny. It is never our identity. We don't remain there. We don't stay there. It doesn't matter what others say about me, how they label me, how they brand me. But now I've come to a realization that this is what God say of me. This is how He sees me. My friends, I want to tell you that God wants you to be healed, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. He wants you to be a whole person. You see, the word holy, H-O-L-Y, really it means to be whole. To be whole means to be a normal person. A normal person able to love and receive love. A normal person in Christ. Sin distorts us. Sin destroys us. Sin makes us abnormal. But Jesus makes us to be normal again. So holiness means to be complete. Today, you can be a complete person mentally, emotionally. You can be a person that is healed. How? Yes, when you come to Jesus. Jesus is the only healer. There is none other. But how do we do that today? In this story, we learn we need others to carry us. To Jesus because there are times and there are many times we are too weak to come on our own by ourselves we cannot help ourselves in this story my second observation is that this paralytic he cannot help himself he needed his friends most likely let's come back to this story in this passage that they were Jesus were, was at Simon's house the apostle Simon, and a large crowd were gathering in the house and outside the door, the scripture tells us. And then, let's imagine here a bit with us, a group of four men carrying, bearing, <laughs> holding this paralyzed man on his bed, begin to fight their way in against the crowd, trying to get in to see Jesus, to be with Jesus, but they were blocked by the crowds. So, they came up with this brilliant suggestion, this radical, drastic measure they took. They climbed to the roof of the house and the four men began to literally unroof the roof. <laughs> that is quite a surprising thing they did. But to me, what is even more surprising that the owner of the house, 
Simon did not even try to stop them. <laughs> the man proceeded to lower the paralytic on his bed down into the room where Jesus was. What was Jesus' response? Possibly you did not guess it right. Jesus, the scripture tells us, was impressed, but not impressed by the paralytic or the paralytic's faith. Jesus was impressed by the faith of the four friends. Last week, we learned the lesson. We need others to pray for us. And I share with you, when others pray for you, it is just at another level of prayer. Because it is going to be their faith that is going to move the hands of God. Jesus was impressed by the faith of the four men and began to act. My friends today, who is praying for you? Who are those that are and would be carrying you? You need their faith to carry you through. That's the key to making it in life. You can make it. But only with the help from others. There are some things in life that we can try to do for ourselves. And that's all right. But we simply cannot. The phrase that I used to hear growing up at home, God helps those who help themselves. God helps only those who help themselves, in fact. It's a motto that emphasizes the importance of self-initiative and independence. The, this expression is known around the world, in fact, and it is oftentimes used to inspire, to motivate others uh, to self-help. Now that I'm a little older, <laughs> I begin to realize that this phrase is not entirely true. In fact, it is quite unbiblical and impractical. I've come to a place in life so many times that I cannot help myself as much as I want to help myself. I cannot. <laughs> Instead, I've learned that God can help those who cannot help themselves. God can help those who cannot help themselves. For example, salvation. I cannot save myself. But God can help me. He can save me. But I must come to a place where I admit, I acknowledge, and then I allow God to step in to help me, to assist me. Today, my friends, we have come to a place that we cannot help ourselves. We need God to help us. And so many times, God would help us by working through our friends, the four friends to carry us. We are paralyzed in so many areas of our lives. When I was young, oh, I was so paralyzed in the area of talking to girls. I would never speak to girls. <laughs> Quite a bondage right there. Until when I reached the age of 18, 19 years old, I would never talk to girls. That was the block right there, paralyzed. And for a long time, I would never talk about my dad. My father, who left me when I was five, I would always avoid that conversation and that question. Some of us, we try to forgive, but we are paralyzed there. We cannot. As much as we want to, we cannot. We try to break free from that addictions, but we are paralyzed there. We try to break off a toxic relationship, but we are paralyzed. We try to love an unloving person, or an unloving spouse, but then we are paralyzed. We cannot. We just could not. My friends, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed to ask, to invite, to allow others to carry you, to carry you to Jesus. Their faith to carry you through to Jesus because only Jesus can give you the healing, freedom and the deliverance that you deserve, that is yours. Let us come back to the text again. Okay, I want to share with you another point in regards to receiving our wholeness. 
Did you notice that in this text, it did not mention explicitly that the paralytic came to Jesus for the purpose of healing? That was just, you know, that wasn't expli explicitly mentioned. We thought that he, that was what he needed, obviously, isn't it? Because when Jesus saw the faith of his friends, he was impressed by the faith of his friends. Jesus spoke to this paralytic and Jesus said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. To me, that is quite a surprising statement that Jesus made for two reasons. Number one, as I said, this man, what he needed was a physical healing from Jesus, not the forgiveness of his sins. And then why did Jesus pronounce his forgiveness first and then heal him? All right? Reason number two, that this man, if he would have wanted a forgiveness of sin, he wouldn't have gone to Simon's home or to meet Jesus. He should have gone to the temple and then to present a sin offering to receive forgiveness from the high priest. So, therefore, when Jesus pronounced, your sins are forgiven, there was a problem. The scribes, the priests were offended. They were upset because, number one, Jesus was not in the temple. Number two, Jesus was not a high priest. He's not allowed, empowered to do that, to forgive. Number three, there was no sacrifice made. So, this was a very controversial act. No wonder the scribes in, in Mark chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 7, responded. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So Jesus knew what they were thinking of. So I want us to, to, to look at this story deeper now. The paralytic came, obviously, for a physical need. But when Jesus saw the paralytic, Jesus saw something that is even more urgent and immediate, an immediate and a more urgent need. And that is a need for forgiveness, a spiritual need. When you come to Jesus, Jesus can see all the other needs in your life that you couldn't even see it yet. Jesus can see those things that are even deeper than the superficial need. As a young little lad, as a young boy, I came to Jesus because I was lost in life. I was in a boarding school. I was, I, I was aimless in life. And I came to Jesus to find purpose. But little did I know, not only I received purpose and then a call into the ministry, but Jesus healed my past, healed me. You know, growing up without a father, he healed me. Jesus took away that bondage in me, that shyness in me. I was afraid, as I said, to talk to girls. The sense of the inferiority complex in my life, Jesus healed me. He set me free. Jesus gave me a beautiful future. Jesus gave me a beautiful wife and then a family. Little did I know. I did not ask. I did not even realize all of those areas in my life. What a tremendous Jesus that we worship. Jesus would do the same for you. He would. Now, Jesus gives this man a greater and a deeper healing than he even realized he needed. And he can do the same for you. Let me close with this. This story challenges us on a lot of fronts. But one of the most profound challenges is that it invites us to think about which crowd we are in. So there are at least three crowds, three options. The first, the first crowd that is willing to do whatever it takes to bring this paralytic man to take him to Jesus, to carry him to Jesus. The second crowd would be the religious group, those who were baffled, those who resented Jesus, for healing and for forgiving this man. And then finally, the large crowd, the biggest crowd, they saw all of these things happening and the scripture says they were amazed. 
they celebrated and they glorified God that day. So, let me think for a moment here. I believe the large crowd, the third group, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that they would also have friends and family members that are broken, that are weak, who would need healing from Jesus that day. Possibly everybody in that crowd have somebody at their home who was lying on a man. But the question is, why didn't they bring that friend, that family that should be there to receive healing, but they were not there? Why didn't they bring? Why didn't they not climb the roof like what the four friends did and lower that person who needed Jesus that day? A missed opportunity. They were present where Jesus was, but they did not bring the one and those who needed Jesus there that day. Do you have someone on a mat at your home right now? Do you have someone on a mat in your family at this moment? Do you have someone on a mat in your neighborhood or your workplace? Friends who need you to be like that four friends to carry them to Jesus. I believe all of us here, including myself, once upon a time, God used that four friends who, because of their persistency, their determination, brought us, climb up that roof, lower us, and brought us to Jesus so that we can be saved and healed. Someone who, that would say, I will not rest, I will never rest until you come to Jesus. They took risks. We rejected them again and again, and yet they kept on coming back because they cared for us so much. And finally, we met Jesus. When I was a schoolboy in boarding school, Brother Andy Chu, he's a church worker. Every Sunday afternoon, he would drive the church van to pick me up, to carry me to church. But guess what? As a young boy, I wasn't interested to go to church. There were so many other things that I would do. And many times, I was supposed to be there waiting for Brother Andy but I wasn't there. And yet, Brother Andy would not give up on me. He would not be angry with me. He kept coming back every Sunday afternoon, same place, same time, not knowing even if I would show up. And finally, I felt bad. And I went to church because of Brother Andy. And finally, I got saved. I knew Jesus because Brother Andy would not give up on me. He carried me. There are many different people or circumstances at work to bring a person to Jesus, to bring you, to bring I, to bring us, to the place where we could be healed, to the place where you could be whole. Today, I want to challenge us that you would be one of the four friends to carry someone to Jesus this week. Someone who is in the mat, on a mat that needed Jesus, that you would take the risk to take them to Jesus, would you? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we receive our healing and our wholeness in Christ. I pray for each one, the area of our lives that are paralyzed and paralyzed for so long, and we even accepted it and believe in our own limitations, our weaknesses, our brokenness. Today, we declare that we are whole and healed in Jesus' name, that addictions to be broken, that bondage to be set free in your name. And today, we pray that you will use us, give us faith to believe that that friend, that family member that is on a mat right now, Lord, that we would carry them that we will have the faith to carry them to Jesus, to receive their healing and their salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.